overlooking the Cooper's Ferry site, which is located just upstream of the mouth of Rock Creek. And in this area, we can see some pretty dramatic things, geologically speaking, that have happened in the past that are relevant to understanding the site itself and time periods before and after the occupation of Cooper's Ferry. The Salmon River, as you see it right now, has been in this position for roughly the last 2,000 years. The Salmon River has largely been depositing sand along these very small beaches. And larger alluvial deposition or flooding in the floodplain has not been a part of the last 2,000 years of the geologic history of the Salmon River Canyon. Before 2,000 years, the Salmon River flowed at a gradient of roughly 1.8 to 2.5 feet drop per mile. Today, the Salmon River flows at roughly 11 to 15 feet drop per mile. That's a significant difference. What this also means is the character of the river has also changed. The Salmon River, in changing from a low angle gradient river, moved from a slower, sluggish, lower energy river to the river you see today. And that is, we have a lot of deposition from the river through time. So in terms of geoarchaeology, we would refer to, refer to this as alluvial deposition. Uh, the river exceeds its bank, it goes out onto the surrounding landscape, and as the energy goes down, it can leave behind sediments that help sites build up. It adds new sediment to the site, causing it to accumulate stratigraphic units. So when the stream is at its highest, and it's really pushing material, it'll move just about everything downstream. When you crank it way down, it starts to leave behind big stuff and the channel can become constrained. So the other thing it'll do is it will do a couple things simultaneously. It will deposit, it will transport, and it will erode. So right now we can look at, there. this is um, erosion occurring in this basin. It's moving stuff out, you can follow it, and it gets deposited in certain spots. In fact, right here, it's getting deposited all right there. It's making what's called a delta. But we're also getting erosion of what's called a nick point right now. So if you look closely in this area, look at this mark right here. That, this mark is moving its way upstream. So because there's turbulence down here and it's actually causing it to erode. So that's the same situation that we think happened about 2,000 years ago when we had faulting that raised a part of the system uh, in the Salmon River and it caused this kind of, it would plunge over the end of it and it would cause turbulence and begin to rip upward. Other things that control uh, the river's behavior can be the amount of sediment that's introduced versus the amount of water that's introduced into the system. So if there's too much sediment and not enough water, the river has a hard time maintaining stable channels and they would tend to break up into lots of little small channels. So that's a, called a braided stream versus a meandering stream. Um, now with our system, because we made uh, sea level go up, because we made that pipe go higher, we created an ocean down there. So that, po that pool is effectively the ocean. And this is a river going in, and this is like the Mississippi Delta. So the Mississippi River is dumping this stuff out into that part. And why it will deposit it at just that spot has to do with the fact that you have opposing geomorphic forces. So we have um, channel flow, so this stuff is moving down here quickly. As it hits that, that body of water that's not moving, it loses its ability to do work. All of a sudden now, its ability to transport, it's like it runs into a traffic jam and it has to slow down. And as it slows down, it can't hang on to the sediment anymore and it will fall out. Gravity will drop it out. We now, lower sea level, what do we get? We almost instantly get new land. So actually the coastline begins to move out. And this is what happens during the last ice age. If you lower sea level, all of a sudden we get extra coastline. So in Oregon, for example, we have like up to 30 miles of extra coast during the last ice age. It's now all in the water, the sea level went back up. But what also is gonna happen is that um, this system is going to achieve a state of equilibrium with the lower sea level, and it's already doing it right here. So see how it's knifing through this? And it's it created a terrace. So it's actually gonna cut down, it's gonna make a canyon. So if we let this thing run long enough, the channel will knife into itself and create a canyon. Because it, if it's flowing at a certain angle to the ocean, and the ocean goes down, 
the river will start to cascade down and needs to achieve a new elevation. Its channel wants to be in equilibrium. We also have some effects that are happening here. There's some tilt. So our system is tilted slightly this direction. So we're getting preferential movement of this. We're going to get, this is probably going to channelize through here. And this is all going to get left behind as a terrace. And terraces are just abandoned parts that used to be in the floodplain. And the floodplain is that part of the system that becomes submerged when the river exceeds its channel fill. So from beach to beach, and you go down underwater, that's basically the size of the channel. If you exceed bankful discharge or flood the system, it will go out and then go horizontal. It will move out across the landscape. Like our site. Yeah, that's what it'll do. It will flood to our site. And it did in the past. So, Sarah, right in front of you is a bulb. Can you uh, turn the knob, there's a little silver knob, turn that so it's tight. That is off. Now, squeeze that over and over and over. Quick. <laughs> so we're getting tectonic uplift. So there's a fault system in there that's causing uplift to happen. What's it doing? It's shoving the channel to one preferential side. So the Salmon River meanders in its course largely because of things like alluvial fans. You see in this case, we increase discharge but the river still can't get rid of this big deposit of alluvial fan material. In fact, the fan's actually deflecting the river around it. And if you go down to any place in the canyon with a big fan, you'll see that pattern of the tree. What do you think is going to happen when we remove that obstruction and we get our system flowing again? Let's turn the water on and let's see what happens. So look, you can see where the channel's preferentially forming. Look at that already. Knifing through Edward erosion. Mm -hmm. So moving back. How much of that is unpredictable? I mean, as to exactly where it's going to knife through. Yeah, I, I think if you had a perfect topographic model of the surface, you could predict it. Oh. Mm -hmm. There's actually a lot of fluvial uh, geomorphology like calculations you can figure that. So, in addition to using stream tables. We sometimes do other versions of these by uh, piling up a large amount of dirt and putting a bucket with, as you can see here, holes in it that just drain out and sort of create a watershed. We were calling this Mount Wilcox. So as you can see, as the water works its way down through the system, it starts to move larger materials that are choking the channel. We have uh, interaction of water moving and gravity is sort of moving things in a alluvial way and then also through colluvial process. Sometimes we get a super saturated flows or sort of like mudslides will push stuff down even farther. As it gets to the very bottom of um, our landscape, we start to see the accumulation of sediments that were eroded from upslope down below and we'll get the formation of alluvial fans. Alluvial fans are just areas where coarse sediment and fine sediment will come out of transport, out of suspension, start to deposit themselves horizontally across the landscape. As coarse sediments get deposited at the bottom of the slope, the energy required to move them is so diminished that they just simply fall out of suspension and come to rest. And what can also happen is that these coarse materials will block channel uh, routes and cause the stream to have to reorganize itself laterally. And as it does that, you'll have multiple channels working sometimes at the same time or a channel will move itself horizontally across a landscape and deposit the sediments in a cone or a fan-like shape, thus giving the name to alluvial fans. Alluvial fan stratigraphy is really complex because you can get the operation of one channel at one point in the landscape at one time and then as it moves over its position is reoriented to cut and fill with new sediments in another part of the landscape so as you dig downward through these landscapes you don't see the same record everywhere so to simulate also how alluvial basins fill up we put this board across the bottom of our mount wilcox drainage and as you can see in this time lapse video it's filling in really nicely and we're going to let it run for a little bit. 
as it accumulates sediments, it's going to give us some really interesting stratigraphy that shows us coarse sediments and fine sediments deposited in different layers. And at one point here, I think we're going to let it dry out a little bit, then we'll make it flow again, just so you can see sort of how that works. And there we go. So this sort of simulates the way flash floods might work in an arid environment. Uh, a lot of sediments will accumulate in the drainages until there's enough water to do the work required to push them downstream into the lower part of the basin. So as the system accumulates greater uh, amounts of sediment, it brings the base level of the stream up higher and eventually it might overtop or breach through the edge of its uh, downstream obstruction, which I think is going to happen here next. Yep, so you can see it flowing out the side there. As it does so, it incises into itself. We made it run another big sort of mudslide, flash flood scenario again, but you can see on the edges it's still starting to cut down a little bit farther. The large accumulation in the central part is really diverting the streams off to the right and to the left uh, and keeping it from depositing stuff much in the middle. So we're going to let it dry up, and then we're also going to uh, then look at the stratigraphy in the basin. We put some volcanic ash into the upper part of the basin and then ran it out so you can see some white sediment here that is uh, covering the last part of the landscape. So we removed the board in order to expose the end of our basins. You can see what accumulated inside. Clean it up with a trowel and look at that beautiful stratigraphy. Lots of different events in there. Then we re-ran more water across the top. And as the water cascades over the edge, it actually erodes, creating what's called a nick point. As the stream cuts down, it creates a lot of turbulence, starts to move upstream, pushes sediments out into an alluvial fan. As more water enters the system, we get multiple points of exit where you get a lot of erosion and the creation of multiple fans next to each other. And uh, these are actually called bajadas when you get alluvial fans that coalesce on the edges to create big aprons. As the stream continues to run, we get accelerated degradation of our alluvial basin fill. It wants to basically push this stuff down lower into our alluvial landscape. The stuff that gets left behind that's not eroded well, would end up being technically terraces. And uh, it also represents an older part of our landscape, something that happened earlier. So we put the uh, obstruction back in the board and then we filled it up again. And what we want to do is simulate how pit features can accum accumulate in the landscape uh, in a similar way that we see at the Cooper's Ferry site. So we dug a hole uh, inside the area where we think it's going to flow really nicely when we run water. We then packed it full of white volcanic ash to make a really a nice contrasting color. And then we put a pin in the top of this so we wouldn't lose it and we re-ran the stream. And as the stream begins again, it pushes more sediment down Mount Wilcox into the basin, starts to fill in because we have that obstruction there. You can see the pin in the center. And at the end, we have it all dried out. It's nearly buried. We've got a lot of accumulation of sediment. Remove the board once again, clean the stratigraphy up. And then we're also going to excavate in to where the pin is to expose the pit feature in cross-section. And this is actually really pretty similar to what we're seeing in the site in Area B. So you see it there, the little white uh, infilled deposit? That's our pit feature that we created and packed full of the white volcanic tephra, that is the Mazama tephra. So, in a